Okay, wonderful. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, like Morgan said, uh, my name is Tegan and I've just finished my honours project. So uh, I guess I'm here to tell you a little bit about the research that I have done, which is into false admissibility during continental subduction. Um, so as geo geoscientists assume that with increasing pressure and temperature, the mineral assemblages within metamorphic rocks transform from amphibolite fascist minerals, which include minerals such as quartz, plagioclase and biotite, to eclogite fascist minerals such as coazite, omphacite and garnet. Now, this implies that we assume all lithologies are equally as reliable as acting as indicators of the complex geotech, uh, geotectonic processes that have shaped our world as we know it today. However, this assumption is called into question in ultra high pressure metamorphic terrains, which are uh, basically areas of the Earth's crust, which have been subducted into to in excess of 125 kilometers depth. Now, the reason why we know these regions have reached such great depths is because of the preservation of eclogite fascist minerals within these, this mafic uh, eclogite component of these terrains, which typically comprises only about 2% of these terrains. However, the bulk of these regions, around about 95%, is actually comprised of this felsic orthonice, which, has, which basically only records amphibolite fascist mineral assemblages. Um, now, this is quite problematic as it implies that large portions of the Earth's, Earth's crust may remain kinetically inhibited uh, during continental subduction, which is a bit of a pain for geoscientists trying to uh, use these rocks to unravel the rock record. So it's really important for us to be able to quantify and understand the differing responses of these different lithologies to identical PT conditions. And that's where my research comes in. Uh, my field area was in the Western Nice Complex in Norway, a map of which is shown here on the right. And uh, this is arguably the archetypal ultra high pressure metamorphic terrain. It underwent ultra high pressure metamorphism during this event known as the Caledonian Orogeny, roughly 430 to 385 million years or so ago. Uh, now, most of the studies within this uh, complex have been done in these three ultra high pressure domains in the north, which contain uh, extensive eclogite uh, and evidence of microdiamond and coasite. Um, but not a lot of work has been done on those felsic amphibolites. Now, rare felsic eclogite can be found in these particular areas, but it's always associated with shear zones or hydrated mafic boudins, which are areas of deformation and fluid flux. So I guess, in terms of my project, rather than looking at this highly studied northern area, I instead looked further south along the Sonja Fjord, near this little town called Lavik, so a little blow up of my field area sort of shown here. Now this region experienced limited metamorphic reworking and also the limited PT estimates from this area indicate it underwent uh, peak PT conditions of between 20 and 24 kilobars, 650 to 700 degrees Celsius. So I guess in terms of my project, in trying to address this question of um, broader scale rock reactivity, there were two aims of my project. The first, of all was, the first of these was to construct a geological face map of a spatially restricted area in order to, I guess, um, quantify uh, where these different felsic and mafic lithologies were in terms of their spatial and temporal relationships to each other. And then the second aim of my project was to use forward equilibrium modeling using a software called Thermocalc in order to compare the peak PT conditions that were recorded by these mafic eclogite and felsic amphibolite um, within my field area. Now the goals of this were to basically answer the question or test the hypothesis of whether or not these rocks remained metastable or rather recrystallized along the retrograde path. And so metastability basically means, so did these rocks actually never react past amphibolite fascias at all? Were they uh, inhibited by some kind of mechanism from reacting to eclogite fascias? And if so, uh, what is a plausible mechanism to explain that process? So the first step of my project was basically to construct my geological face map. Now, as you can see, I'd just like you to note the scale. So this was a very, very small area, uh, but it did contain a lot of lithological change. 
Now, in order to simplify it for the, pro uh, for the purposes of this presentation, there are just a couple of key things that I'd like you to take away, and that is with regards to the lithologies that I did end up modelling. So the first of these was the garnet bearing felsic gneiss. As you can see from this photo, there's a reason why not a lot of studies have been done on these rocks. They're pretty boring. Uh, probably the most exciting thing about this was the very rare garnet in this lithology and also the biotite uh, defined foliation, which trended northwest southeast. Now, this foliation was shared by adjacent low strain eclogite, um, but uh, this photo here basically shows a second uh, a foliation that found in my field area, which was this subvertical S2 foliation trending north, northwest, south, southeast. Now, this particular lithology, which was the second, lithology, uh, second rock type that I ended up modeling, displayed fengite veins and also uh, plagioclase veins and this re these really beautiful garnets and, and omphocytes, which you can sort of see here. Uh, this foliation was overprinted by a tightly folded diatexite, which extended off into 100 meter plus deformation zones, which are quite common throughout the Western Nice complex. So with a handle on where these different lithologies were in regards to space, it was now important to date these rocks because the Western Nice complex had undergone two metamorphic events prior to the Caledonian orogeny. So it was just important to, I guess, confirm that this region had undergone ultra high pressure metamorphism. So uh, first of all, what I tried to do was date some lovely zircons from my low and high strain eclogites. And unfortunately, when I dated them, I was what I was trying to date was these outer rims. And I ended up, uh, because they were so thin, I did end up returning ages that were mostly from one of the earlier uh, orogenic events known as the second Norwegian orogeny, which occurred around about 900 million years or so ago. But uh, all was not lost because several of those dates did indicate um, sort of they were starting to trend towards the Caledonian orogeny. So I subsequently went back and dated uh, the same rocks, but using rutile uranium led geochronology instead. And thankfully, uh, my high strain eclogite came back with an age of 399.8 plus or minus 7.8 million years, and my low strain eclogite of 416 plus or minus 18 million years. So uh, those ages fell within that Caledonian, um, Caledonian age bracket and confirmed that the region did undergo ultra high pressure metamorphism. The next step in my process was obviously to construct my PT pseudo sections for high strain eclogite and garnet bearing felsic gneiss. Now, for those of you who are just um, unfamiliar with PT pseudo sections, basically they're a visual representation of where a set of minerals is or mineral assemblage is stable within pressure and temperature space. So each of these fields uh, is, represents where a specific mineral assemblage is stable and they're separated by lines which indicate where a mineral either enters or leaves the assemblage. So for example, this particular line here is, indicates where hornblende enters the assemblage down pressure because these two mineral assemblages are identical except for the fact that this one here is missing hornblende. Um, so with my high strain eclogite, from thin section, you could see that uh, the mineral assemblage included amphiboles, uh, ilmenite and rutile, a bit of biotite, some garnet, um, these really, really finely grained albite, omphocyte, and a little, little bit of magnetite, symplectites. There was a little bit of quartz and zircon in there as well. So from uh, this, these petrographic sort of uh, observations allowed me to sort of start constructing this PT model. Now, from my observations in the field, I knew that this rock probably hadn't crossed the solidus, which is indicated by this yellow line. And there's definitely evidence of peak horn blends. And given that the limited PT estimations from my particular field area were between 650, 700 degrees Celsius, 20 and 24 kilobars, this field was what I identified as my likely peak field. Now, unfortunately, that field is quite big, so I had to do a little bit of extra work in order to constrain what the peak PT conditions actually were. So I did that with using two different methods, the first of which was to use Thermocalc Investigator, which is this really neat program, uh, to basic, which basically uh, calculates outputs based on mineral, like the parameters for some minerals that you're looking at. So I chose to look at my peak horn blend grains. I looked at the modal proportions, the sodium content, and the amount of titanium within their rims in order to get a bit of a handle on what the peak PT conditions may be. And uh, my second method was to use a Koenigman rutile geothermometry under the assumption that zircon, quartz, and rutile were all growing together during program metamorphism. And so these uh, methods allowed me to constrain my peak PT conditions between 20 and 22 kilobars at roughly 650 degrees Celsius. 
So I then repeated that same process for my garnet bearing felsic gneiss, which had a very anhydrous assemblage consisting mostly of plagioclase, clay feldspar and quartz. This garnet uh, was one of, I think, two in my thin section and caused great excitement. Uh, there was a little bit of biotite and some little bit of chlorite in there as well, but again, not very much at all. So this PT pseudo section on the left here basically shows the peak field from uh, my high strain eclogite in comparison to the peak, peak maximum possible PT conditions that the garnet bearing felsic nice recorded. So the peak fields should have contained garnet, um, but not muscovite. And instead my model actually computed a muscovite present uh, garnet absent mineral assemblage. So this muscovite in reaction actually puts a constraint on the maximum possible PT that this rock could have recorded at between eight or nine kilobars at roughly 650 degrees Celsius. So in terms of putting all of those different observations together and whether or not, and understanding I guess whether or not my observations either supported or refuted that metastability hypothesis, I guess it's important to sort of look at the garnet bearing felsic gneiss. So the garnet bearing felsic gneiss had no muscovite and very rare garnet. Whereas if it had reached the peak PT conditions that were recorded by high strain eclogite, if it had reacted to eclogite fascist mineral assemblages, you would expect to see um, perhaps some evidence of peak muscovite um, because at this point, uh, so these dotted lines basically represent the modal proportions of high pressure phases within my model at, at this particular point. So you would expect to see garnet at roughly 8%. You'd expect to see muscovite at roughly 8%. Um, very low modal proportions of kyanite and rutile, possibly, um, or perhaps peak omphacite. And you would also expect to see possibly some evidence of, of, of textures within the, within the rock indicative of recrystallization. But none of those observations were ones that I made within that garnet bearing felsic gneiss. And so that sort of indicates that metastability is more likely than recrystallization. Metastability is, in addition to that, more likely because it's actually quite, um, it's quite easy to provide a plausible explanation as to why this process would have take, taken place. And that is... Uh, basically the availability of fluid to catalyze and take part in metamorphic reactions. So if you recall in my introduction, I did mention that the very, very rare felsic eclogite that you find within these northern ultra high pressure um, domains is always adjacent to regions of uh, fluid fl uh, regions of fluid, fluid flow or intense deformation. Now my garnet bearing felsic gneiss only had 0.34 weight percent water. It was it had a very anhydrous mineral assemblage and uh, as compared to adjacent mafic eclogite. And this is probably a good reason to a, a good way to explain why it did not transform to eclogite fascist minerals and rather remained metastable. So I guess the key things that I'd like you to take away from my presentation today are that, first of all, the high strain eclogite within my field area did record peak Caledonian ultra high pressure metamorphic conditions of between 20 and 22 kilobars, whereas the garnet bearing felsic gneiss only recorded a maximum possible PT of eight or nine kilobars. And that garnet bearing felsic gneiss had no evidence of ultra high pressure minerals. It had no evidence that it ever had any of those minerals and it didn't have any textures indicative of recrystallization and those observations indicate that metastability is more likely than recrystallization and also it's possible to provide a plausible explanation for that metastability that being that these felsic orthonices were anhydrous and therefore didn't have enough fluid within them in order to catalyze metamorphic reactions uh, unlike the mafic eclogites which obviously did and what this implies is that fluid availability is a really important factor when determining whether or not the rocks that you're looking at in an attempt to understand uh, complex geodynamic processes are accurate geodynamic indicators. Specifically in my field area, but this does have implications for other, uh, for the westernized complex in general and possibly for other ultra high pressure metamorphic terrains around the world. Um, so I'd just like to thank a whole bunch of really wonderful people, including my supervisors, my cohort, um, the GSA Playford Trust and the Uni of Adelaide, Adelaide Microscopy, and the wonderful people at the search tank. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone may have with regards to my research.
First of all, we might go, Mark, do you have a question? Did you want to unmute yourself and ask take it? Oh wait, that's not a question, sorry, that's a clapping hands. Oh, they're clapping my hands? Oh my that god, I got hands. clapping well hands! And a thumbs up! Thank you, Mark! I don't know you, but thank you! That's really nice, that's really good. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, another clapping hand! <laughs> Sorry, the wonders of Zoom. The wonders of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So there's no questions we might move on to. Oh, oh I've got Alan. a question. I've got a question. No, you don't, Alan. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. You want to hear Dylan's speech? Do you want to hear Dylan's speech? Sure. Well, What's we've up? got plenty of time for Dylan's, Dylan's great talk. Um, no, that was great, Tegan. Um, and it, Thank it's you. interesting work and a common, a common problem everywhere we find high pressure rocks these funny little pods in the mafic mythologies and and so difficult to know whether the felsic mythology is is has had the same has had the same history um mm -hmm. you did you did some nice little mapping you know on a very small area but some nice detailed mapping how do you uh, how does that fit into your story because you really talk about that you talk all about the sort of the pt stuff on the different samples but but do you is, can you see structurally whether it's possible that the the um, the, the mafic rocks had a different history than the felsic rocks? No. So I guess because it was um, because it was on such a small scale, the the likelihood of that um, uh, that tectonic juxtapositioning just isn't really that likely. Um, also, in terms of so, are you sort of wondering whether or not those mafic rocks possibly? Um, yeah, well, much deeper, have been much deeper. So, you know, whether you could see actually in the rocks themselves, whether you could you could find uh, the potential that those those mafic boudans um, had had been incorporated into a felsic rock um, that hadn't been nearly as deep. So, almost like little pips. Um, oh yeah, like it sort of like the back of the right? much lower uh, lower temperature models that people have for subduction zones where they have. You know, in melanges where you have pips of things that have had much, much um, higher pressure histories in the surrounding matrix. I know it's a sort of a different, a different environment, but 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 that sort of model that they really haven't. You, you can see structural evidence that they haven't necessarily had the same history. Okay, so I guess in terms, of the good thing about doing that um, face map was that you could really clearly see that the garnet bearing felsic gneiss that I modelled shared S1 foliation with the low strain equigite, and so you and because you could sort of date the foliation in the low strain equigite, that indicates that they were sort of in place. I guess they underwent the same metamorphic events. So, you're, date, you're dating that with the rutiles, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So of course that's a. That's a thermometer though, isn't it? And it's an enclosure temperature of lead in those rutiles is very close to your maximum temperatures. Your, yeah, your five, temperatures. Degrees. And, and there's quite a lot of slop on it. So, you know, I wonder if you, you wouldn't just be recording when it stopped being at 600 degrees plus rather than when it, when it formed. Well, I guess the only real way to test that would just be to do more work on that particular area. I mean, that's the- Always that's, more work. <laughs> always more work, always more work, yeah. So the, the disappointing thing was that I wasn't able to date those zircon rims. That was that was really annoying um, when that age data came back. And it's like, oh, it's all speck and Norwegian. It's just like, oh, that's because I hit the wrong zones because uh, the spot size I used was, was too big, unfortunately, for those particular rims. So the only real way, I guess, a way of confirming that to, uh, I guess, a greater degree would just be to go back and to date those zircons with a small spot size. Because, and that would pretty much be a, a way to confirm that. That would be, yeah, something something that I would actually like to do in order to, Thank you. <laughs> to confirm without a doubt, but the rutile age data is unfortunately all I was able to get because on this project, but yeah. Thank you, Tegan. That was a great talk. Um, any other any other questions? I think you're good. Nope. Great, well done. I shall I shall mute and hide. You're gonna have to hide. But you can mute. Hide. <laughs> but Dylan Dylan's the star of the show now. Dylan, take it away. Okay, so as Tegan's lovely introduced, so Dylan Brown's PhD student um, here at the University of Adelaide. 
Um, and he's going to be chatting to us. We're going to be going far down south to Tassie um, and talking about some metamorphism down there. So thank you, Dylan. Cool. Thanks, Morgan. Um, I'll just pop up my screen. All right. How does that look for everyone? There we go. Yeah. Load it up. Yep. Pull up now. Cool. Um, so yeah, first of all, thanks. Um, thanks, Morgan, Anna, Alan, for the invitation to speak. Um, it's good to be here in virtual space um, from the comfort of my own dining room. So that's that's always nice. Um, but yeah, so I'm, as Morgan mentioned, I'm a PhD student at the University of Adelaide um, in the Department of Earth Sciences. And I guess what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of go through some of the work that we've been doing, looking into the kind of the, the record of um, metamorphism preserved in the rocks of uh, central Tasmania. Um, and specifically the Franklin metamorphic complex in, in central West Tasmania. Um, Sorry, just before you keep going, did you just want to um, share, just um, press start on your presentation mode? Oh, yes. Up sure. as full screen. How's that? Um, might take a second. Hasn't, has it come up on your screen? Yeah, I can see it now. Dylan, you might want to share, you might be sharing the wrong oh, screen. There we go. Much better. Oh, it's full screen now? Yes, yeah, full screen now. Cool. Um, yeah, so the work that we've been currently doing is um, kind of work in progress and we still have some data to collect and things like that. Um, so I guess I'll show um, some findings, um, but I think that what we can say from these findings so far is that there's definitely evidence for um, both Cambrian aged and Mesoproterozoic age metamorphism from these rocks. Um, the Cambrian age uh, metamorphism is definitely well established and um, uh, well, is well accepted in the literature, but this Mesoproterozoic age is definitely um, more enigmatic. But um, yeah, I'd like to go through uh, these findings so far in the context of the Franklin complex. Uh, so this uh, on the left here is a map of Western Tasmania, which I'm sure many is um, the oldest rock in uh, Tassie. Um, and they've structurally divided up Western Tasmania into four domains, um, which I've tried to show on, on this map here with these, uh, these purple annotations. Um, but the, the kind of zone that's most interested, that I'm most interested in is this internal zone here, um, also called the Tyenan region. And um, the Tyenan region contains the most deformed um, rocks in Western Tassie um, and the highest grade rocks. And these, these rocks are specifically in the Franklin metamorphic complex. Um, and the Franklin metamorphic complex is uh, in this yellow region here. Um, and I'll go into kind of the different rock types that we find there um, in, in the next few slides. but. Broadly speaking, we get um, kind of pervasive occurrences of quartzites. Um, sometimes they contain mica and have a weak fabric as well. We have um, weakly deformed to myelinitic uh, metaplytic rocks, and we also see uh, occurrences of leucosomes in these metasediments. So um, there's definitely evidence that melting occurs. So we're looking at a, quite a high grade system in the Franklin. Um, and there are also local occurrences of eclogite basses, mafic rocks that are preserved as boudins. Um, and our metasedimentary rocks, they, they host these. And so the kind of well-accepted model um, that is used to explain the, the occurrence of these high-grade rocks um, is kind of in the context of East Gondwana, uh, the Cambrian East Gondwana margin, where it's thought that the eastern uh, margin of Tasmania um, was subducted. Um, and on that subducting slab here, we get the occurrence of high pressure metamorphism. Um, and we also see um, ophiolite abduction onto the Tasmanian microcontinent as well. And evidence for that is kind of dotted around Western Tasmania, these little black dots here on the map that represent the kind of ultra uh, complexes. Um, and this, this East Gondwana context, this model um, kind of brings me to the point of studying um, 
Tassie and the Franklin complex specifically, and that's really to understand the metamorphism that's going on here, um, that's recorded in these rocks in the context of East Gondwana, and try and compare it to other styles of metamorphism along the margin. So, uh, along uh, this is a on the left is a map of um, East Gondwana margin, um, and we know that there's different styles of metamorphism that are recorded um, that that occurred along the East Gondwana margin. Um, so. In the north, um, in Eastern Australia, we, we see things like eclogites and blue schists that are kind of preserved in these melange-like systems with serpentinite, um, indicative of subduction along cold geothermal gradients um, and you know, oceanic subduction. So it's a very cold system up um, in Eastern Australia. Um, in contrast, if we go further down south um, to the East Antarctic segment of the margin, we see a different style of subduction where continental materials being subducted um, and in the outcrop scale in places like the Miller Range we see these eclogite boudins preserved in this kind of more uh, continental derived myelinitic um, gneisses and things like that. So I guess with, with Tassie we want to end, understand the thermal gradients of metamorphism um, and we can, we can do that by um, interrogating um, the rocks of the Franklin complex, the higher grade rocks there. Um, so that, that was really the first point of call um, when looking into these rocks, but what we've come to find is perhaps it's a bit more complicated um, than we originally thought. Um, and so not only are we seeing evidence for Cambrian age metamorphism in the context of East Gondwana, but we think that we might also be seeing um, evidence for a much older Mesoproterozoic metamorphic event. Um, that of course, would be in the context of a kind of Nuna supercontinent configuration. Um, and I guess the question that we'd like to then ask is what was the character of this older um, mesoproterozoic metamorphic event, which is much more um, enigmatic? Um, and also, what are the sources of the protoliths to the metasedimentary rocks of the Franklin? Um, and so, with that, yeah, I guess the next few slides I, I'll go through you know, what we see from the rocks of the Franklin. Um, what, what, can we, what insights can we gain from the mineral assemblages? Um, and then I'd just like to present that evidence of both Cambrian and um, the older Mesoproterozoic metamorphism. Um, so diving back into the Franklin, these are some of the rocks we see. Um, so as I mentioned, we see these mafic eclogites that are preserved um, and enclosed in these uh, quartz mica schist rocks, um, these metapolitic rocks. Um, some of them are weakly deformed, some of them um, have quite strong myelinic fabrics. Um, some of them contain these large um, garnet porphyroblasts here, um, and there are occurrences of kyanite as well. And we also have occurrences of leucosomes as well, so evidence of melting in these metasediments. And there's definitely um, quite a pervasive, um, a pervasive occurrence of uh, quartzites as well. Um, and I guess looking a bit more deeply into these um, boudins, eclogite boudins, we see if, uh, quite a few different minerals, um, but in terms of inferring a peak metamorphic assemblage um, for the eclogites, um, it, it would contain something like garnet uh, clinopyroxene, which would be omphocyte to sodic calcic clinopyroxene, um, amphibole muscovite, epidote rutile and quartz. Um, and they look like they're, they're pretty happy rocks. The minerals uh, look like they're in um, equilibrium with one another. There's not too many um, retrogressive features um, from our photomicrographs. And interestingly, the garnets in these eclogites, they definitely preserve evidence of growth zonation. So this is a manganese compositional map here. Um, and I guess I wanted to show this because, you know, this kind of evidence of growth zonation suggests that either these these rocks were metamorphosed in a very cold system um, or they moved through the, the system quite rapidly um, or a combination of both uh, to a degree. Um, so to the, the metapolitic rocks, there's quite some variability in, in the minerals in these rocks. Up the top here, you can see we have um, garnet porphyroblasts, we have kyanite porphyroblasts as well. Um, in this particular rock, there's not much of a, a fabric. It's quite weak, but um, it's dominated by muscovite. It's a little bit of biotite. Uh, in this pelite here, it's much more um, myelinitic. The fabric, the muscovite fabric wraps our garnet porphyroblasts. 
There's also occurrences of silimonite down here. That's part of the fabric. And again, I mentioned those leucosomes in some of the metapelites. Here's some um, evidence from the photomicrographs um, where we see these coarse grain quartz plagioclase um, domains in these rocks as well. So there's quite a bit of variability with these rocks um, in, in the metapelites. And looking at the garnets as well, there's some interesting things going on in the compositional zonation in the, in the metapelitic garnets. So um, this is one sample with the garnet and the kyanite. Um, these larger garnets here, they preserve quite strong zonation in manganese. And this contrasts to smaller garnets here, which definitely have a less pronounced uh, zonation. And that's just in the one sample there. Um, down here is a calcium map for some of the garnets uh, in the hematitic metapelite. And again, we see quite an interesting zonation pattern with an abrupt increase in calcium as we move from core to rim. So some interesting things I think we can learn from the garnets in these metapelites and um, whether or not these different um, zonation patterns correlate with age. And um, we'll talk about the geochronology of the pelites in a few slides, but um, yeah, I think it's important to, to definitely um, think about what the zonation might be trying to tell us. Um, but first, we've done some geochronology uh, for the mafic budins, um, the equigites, uh, for two mafic samples. Um, so this first sample here, we, we see two different zircon age populations. We see a younger Cambrian age population at about 500 uh, MA, and a much older mesoproterozoic uh, age population at four, about 1450 MA, uh, and some uh, resetting of those older zircons as well. And in the other eclogite sample, um, it just preserves younger Cambrian ages um, and the, the zircons there definitely have metamorphic morphologies um, as well. And looking at the trace element signatures of these zircon grains from both samples, um, there's a number of, of relevant plots here um, as a function of age. Um, but I guess broadly speaking, um, what we can tell from, from the trace element signatures is that these younger zircons, um, which I've tried to kind of signify in purple here, they preserve these, these flat, heavy rare earth element signatures um, and very weak to no European anomalies. Um, and so this suggests that the Cambrian zircons in these eclogites grew uh, in the presence of garnet and in the absence of plagioclase. And that was diagnostic of um, a high pressure eclogite for Hassi's regime. Um, and this, this definitely contrasts with our older uh, zircons, our mesoproterozoic zircons, which I've annotated in blue here. Um, they have these positively slipping rare earth element signatures um, and definitely a more pronounced europium anomaly. So this definitely indicates that we have plagioclase in the assemblage when these zircons formed and uh, less of an influence of Ghana, I suppose, um, which probably indicates um, that these zircons formed at much lower pressures with respect to the um, younger zircons. So we're seeing two different um, systems here um, as recorded by these zircons. And now looking at the uh, pressure temperature conditions of, of these mafic rocks, so these two uh, pseudo sections for uh, mafic samples with um, pressure on the vertical and temperature on the horizontal axis. And again, what we've done with these rocks is we've measured their bulk rock composition to calculate uh, the positions of different mineral equilibria in pressure temperature space. So all these lines here that you see on the pseudo section. And so all the different fields you see um, correspond to different mineral assemblages that are stable in pressure temperature space. And if we, if we remember back to um, the petrology of the eclogites, we inferred a peak metamorphic assemblage. And that peak metamorphic assemblage is modeled in pressure temperature space in this uh, large pressure temperature field here, ordered by this black line. Um, and so this gives us a ballpark range of the pressure temperature conditions um, that these rocks formed at, or this particular sample anyway. But we can be much more precise. And um, what we've done is use mineral compositions um, to, to further constrain our peak conditions. So there's a lot here, but I guess importantly, um, we've used our mineral, we've measured our mineral compositions of our uh, peak minerals, which are these white isoplets um, in the pseudo sections. And we've constrained our uh, peak metamorphic conditions for the first sample between 18 to 20 K bar and six, 680 degrees C uh, as, as labeled by 0.2 here. 
of the other sample, we've constrained it at 20 to 22 kbar and 690 degrees Celsius. So quite high pressure conditions and, and reasonable temperatures. Um, and with that information now, um, we can start to think about the kind of thermal, um, uh, the, the thermal signature of our subduction regime in the, in the Cambrian or the Eastcon wider margin. And so these conditions uh, equate to around about geothermal gradient, about 340 degrees Celsius per GPA, which is uh, quite cold. Um, and so it suggests that, you know, this, the eastern margin of our of, uh, Tasmania was being subducted along quite cold thermal gradients. These rocks were forming um, along quite cold gradients and definitely colder than what's previously been uh, determined um, from these same rocks, which is about uh, 460 degrees C per G. Um, and also I put this, again, this picture of that garnet from the Eclogite that shows evidence of that growth zonation because you know, it's, it's important um, because I think it definitely suggests that we may be getting quite a, um, a fast moving system here to preserve that zonation, either um, it's a very cold system which we've established or um, you know, these rocks were subducted, buried uh, and exhumed quite quickly. And there's also um, a lot of evidence to, to suggest that did actually occur um, as well, a lot of, a lot of other evidence. Um, so moving on to the metapelites, so we've done some monazite uh, uranium lead geochronology um, for a whole bunch of different metapelitic rocks um, and so all these Concordia diagrams here for both the unmelted metapelites and the um, lipozonic metapelites. Um, but importantly, what we found with the unmelted metapelitic samples, um, which I guess I'll draw your attention to this Concordia plot here. Um, they seem to preserve a Mesoproterozoic age of about 1385 uh, MA. Um, and this contrasts with our migmatitic metapelites, and they seem to uh, preserve younger monazites. So if we look at these last, uh, these bottom three Concordia plots here, um, there's definitely um, a lot of common lead and uh, lead loss input. Um, so we couldn't constrain a Cambrian age in these migmatitic metapelites, um, but they definitely contrast with our um, unmelted metapelites, which, uh, which preserve this older age, the monazite preserves this older age. There's no record of the older ages in the um, migmatitic metapelites, so that's interesting. Um, but it seems um, that these, these migmatitic metapelites, um, these monazites in, in the, Pelites recrystallize in the Cambrian, but there's just, like I said, that influence of common lead um, and lead loss. So I think that's really interesting. Um, not only are we getting variability in um, the textures, um, but also in what our monazites record from these different pelites. And just looking at the trace element signatures of monazites, um, we see that this is just trace element concentrations as a function of age. Um, we see that the younger monazites um, tend to have lower yttrium concentrations and higher gadolinium lutetium ratios with respect to the, the older mesoproterozoic monazites. Um, so that suggests that the younger monazites grew uh, in the presence of garnet, um, possibly at high pressures. Um, and we can't really say that um, about the older mesoproterozoic monazites. So again, we're seeing kind of um, contrasting uh, metamorphic characters. Um, and with respect to the mesoproterozoic monazite, it's really difficult to assess the precise character of metamorphism without um, having done pressure temperature modeling. So that's definitely, uh, definitely something to think about in the future, which will be done in the future. Um, and just to wrap up, I'd like to go through just a little bit of data. We've collected some detrital zircon data um, from the the Franklin complex metasedimentary rocks. Um, this data on the left here, it's, it's not from the Franklin complex, it's from uh, the Rocky Cape group in Northwest Tassie. Um, and there was some really good work done by um, Happen et al and Mulder et al recently, looking at the uh, zircon ages from the Rocky Cape group rocks um, and, and correlating these ages with um, the Southern Mawson and Southwest Laurentian basement rocks um, to kind of propose that um, 
the, the prolists to the Rocky Cape rocks were derived and sourced from um, this other Mawson and Southwest Laurentian basements, as opposed to kind of more proximal uh, terrains such as the Northern Mawson and um, the, the Australian Cratons. Um, and then their ages in the Rocky Cape group also a very, um, also correlate with that, the ages from the upper belt cell basin in North America, which is um, undoubtedly sourced from um, Southwest uh, Laurentia. And I guess just comparing what we've seen, uh, what we have from our Franklin metamorphic uh, metapolitic rocks, um, the zircon ages, I think, definitely agree with those that have been derived from the Rocky Cape group as well. Um, and that's because we kind of see this 1.45 GA signature that's uh, characteristic of our southern Mawson, um, the trial zircon signature, and we get these broad 1.6 to 1.8 GA ages as well. Um, so I think we can come to a similar conclusion that the, the Franklin complex um, uh, metapelites were definitely um, sourced from the southern Mawson and, and southwest Laurentia as well. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, I think uh, we definitely have evidence for both anesoproteomorphism in these rocks. Um, and, and really, the next important step is to try and constrain the, the PT conditions of metamorphism uh, in the P lights and, and both for, for Cambrian age metamorphism and mesoproteomorphism age metamorphism. Um, and I think with the the older metamorphism, um, you know, it's going to be important to try and determine what part of the assemblages in the in the metapelites are um, mesoproterozoic, because as you could, could see earlier, they're quite variable. The mineral assemblages are quite variable. Um, so yeah, we really have to think about that carefully in the next um, the next few steps. So yeah, I might leave it there, um, and yeah, open up to questions. Cheers. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I do. Right. Yeah, uh, nice talk, Dylan. Uh, uh, very interesting. I've got two questions. Um, first one, uh, Tasmania is sort of slightly complicated because it's also been uh, subject to tectonism, metamorphism, etc., in the Devonian. So there's a sort of Delamere, a um, Tabaraba, an overprint. Do you see any influence of that? I did notice in one of your zircon ages there, FMC2A, it had a lower intercept of 396, which looks sort of Devonian. Right, yeah, okay, uh, that's this one here, John? Um, yep, that's one. Yeah, look, I I definitely um, haven't read up on, on the, um, much younger uh, metamorphism going on there. Um, you know, I guess it's a good point because um, you look at those monazite concordia plots and you think, you know, those intercepts are quite young. Um, and, you know, possibly that that recent lead loss that I think we're seeing, you know, there's a lot of smearing going on of these monazites um, is possibly due to that, that younger stuff, um, that younger metamorphism. But I definitely think that what's going on with the monazites is quite complex and there's a lot of different factors pulling them about, the, the common lead um, and recent lead loss, so, yeah. Uh, the other question I had uh, related to your, uh, the last couple of points you made relating to the zircon provenance, and you pointed out some similarities between Rocky Cape and the Franklin, but in your original model, those would have been on different plates, so is there any issue there? Rocky Cape will Sorry, be in the margin of Gondwana, and uh, Franklin is part of your collider. So the Franklin would have been part of... You have it as a, a lot of uh, collider in your tectonic figure to start with. Um, oh, in the... Um... Well, as far as I understand it, I mean, this. The suture between, uh, yeah, yes, there. So Rocky Cape is on Gondwana and uh, right. Tasmania, uh, Franklin would be on Tasmania, as I understand it, maybe. Well, I think, um, you know, I guess it's, it's very controversial as to where the kind of Western Tasmania terrain was, you know, back, 
um, probably earlier than seven, 750 MA, um, you know, did it, um, did a drift off to, of Southwest Laurentia and kind of move toward the, toward the, uh, the East Gondwana margin or did it kind of, um, you know, was it elsewhere? And I think, you know, there's definitely, um, it, that's definitely not well understood. Um, I, I don't think that these, this is the conflict here necessarily, um, I guess, yeah, um, not really sure how to answer your question exactly. That's but, all right. um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Alan? Um, I guess, Dylan, so yeah, first of all, what, what, just remind me that you study, what do you think the age of the protoliths, those metasedimentary protoliths, when do you think they, they're the best guess of when they were deposited is? Or what they're the Franklin? Yeah. So that goes back to John's question a bit, because I think right. they're at least early Neoproterozoic, if not early older, don't you? I agree, yes. Yeah, definitely. Older than so, you. so that yeah. then sort of addresses John's question in that you're looking at something that happened 200 million years before it might have then been a collider. Um, so yeah, I agree. I did, with that. I, yeah, I did want to take it one bit further, and it just to be a bit of a pain um, because those 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 reconstructions that are um, looking at the provenance and and Halpin and Mulder and that. And um, they, they were what uh, they were weighing heavily the sort of the 1.4 detritus, I think, as a as a link with North America. Um, yeah. How do you think sort of Laura Morrissey's work on finding these 1.4 granites in South buried in South Australia does that put a spanner in the works? Does that mean you don't need North America as a possible provenance anymore? Um, yeah, good question. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very vaguely familiar with, with Laura's work there, so um, not exactly sure, but um, it, it, maybe it opens up to a broader set of possibilities. Um, it's a pain in the arse. It used to be a really nice, um, nice, uh, nice link, and now it's, I think it's a little bit less. less because it is, it is the same age as you, right? 1.45 is very similar. <laughs> um, no, I think it's something to look into. Um, I'd try to work... Um, we, you know, we may do some more, or we may, um, you know, stick with what we have. We may do some happening stuff as well, but I think, yeah, we're yet to kind of look into the, the full suite of possibilities, but yeah, definitely a good point, Laura's paper. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. thanks for the question. Cheers. Cheers. Great. Do you have any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, I'll, I'll chuck one in from Tasmania, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, do you think there is an uncomfortable degree of overlap between the detrital zircon ages and the metamorphic monazite and or metamorphic other mineral ages? Um, definitely overlap. Don't know about uncomfortable. Um, I guess, you know, with the monazite, I'm pretty convinced that you know, related to a metamorphic event. I mean, we're seeing these are high grade rocks and I would be very, very surprised, I think, to see detrital monazite um, still preserved in, the, in these rocks. So I think as far as the metamorphism, the mesoproterozoic metamorphism is concerned, I think that's, that's pretty solid um, based on our monazite data. But yeah, it just, I think it just exemplifies the kind of complexity we're seeing. We're seeing these similar ages that seem to be um, the quarters of providence and, and metamorphism. So yeah, it's very complex. Um, and of course, you know, it's, old, it's, it's quite far back into um, history and it's kind of a bit convoluted. So um, yeah, quite, quite complex, I think is the, is the main point I'm trying to get across. Yeah, I was just doing a quick Google and um, found a, a paper from 08 by Barry et al. Um, purporting that um, Monazite showed metamorphism, I think at 1290 and nine something or other. Would you consider that your work completely, sorry, 1290 and 920. So do you see any evidence for any events no. of that age or do you say it's, it supersedes that earlier work? I guess, yeah, in the Franklin rocks, um, 
I wouldn't say we, we see evidence of ages that young. Um, um, but, you know, I'm not sure if it supersedes that work. I, um, I haven't, I'm not aware of those, the exact data specifically from Barry. Um, but yeah, I've definitely heard um, and, and read things about metamorphic ages of monazite that's more aligned with what we find here. Um, but it just hasn't really been expanded upon as far as I understand. Um, people have just hinted at it. But yeah, no, thanks for bringing up the, the Berry paper because um, those younger ages would be interesting to look at, for sure. And that was monazite? Was... Um, yeah, this is sort of way, way out of my comfort zone, but um, yeah. chemical uranium thorium lead monazite, apparently. Okay. Any other final questions? Yeah, I've got another one from Tazzy. Um, just interested in your, your dating on the eclogites. You're getting ages about 500. All the previous dating that's been done was giving around 510 to 512. Um, mm -hmm. Have you got any comment on that? Yeah, I did, know, I did um, think that was quite interesting. They're a bit younger, aren't they? Um, of course, the, the second eclogite example there, you know, it's 500 plus or minus eight. So um, as far as I understand, you know, it's, it's the consensus is that we start getting, um, you know, exhumation and it, the development of an extensional system about 505. So, you know, these, these younger ages are pretty interesting. Um, you know, they're not the most precise dates, but um, I'm not, I'm not, I think, I think there was a paper by, Ferguson um, 20, 2015 or something like that, that, that did get similar ages as well. So yeah, um, it's interesting. I think it may be worth trying to constrain the exhumation a bit, a bit more precisely and actually understand um, you know, when did this subduction system really cease and when did we start getting um, you know, the, the deposition of our own conglomerate and the, you know, um, Postorogenic magnetism and things like that, because yeah, so the, the there's post a bit of overlap. The, the dating we've got on the postorogenic magnetism now goes from 507 to 491, so that's sort of okay. it's interesting because that's falling right in the middle of the um, post well, what we're calling postorogenic magnetism, and it also coincides with the age uh, that we're interpreting for the the, the big lead zinc um, ore bodies, the VHMS systems. Um, yeah, it's just a lot younger than I thought it would be. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm a bit surprised at those ages as well. I think there's older um, RBSR data on micas and things which suggests that they were cooled and exhumed 490 to 500. Uh, and in fact, I myself have done a bit of a, uh, rubidium strontium on some micas and you get those sort of ages. So those are the sort of ages that you see you know, the exhumation and the erosion of the terrain to reduce the Duke Snow and conglomerates, et cetera, as well. So um, it kind of seems to post date any sort of tectonic rationale in terms of kind of the high pressure um, convergence and subduction system that your petrology is representing. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't. I guess based on these ages alone, you know, may, maybe these rocks really did shoot up to the surface quite rapidly, um, and then we start obviously getting the, that the transition. The third con? I wouldn't have thought so. So yeah. Sorry, John. I wouldn't have thought that would be resetting the zircon, though. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you know. Maybe um, the younger ages, you know, that they, they, they really are representative of our peak metamorphism. Um, and they got back up really quickly, you know. Um, we, we, it's known that it's, it's a quite, it's a fast tectonic system, so I'm have, not, I'm have not you, sure. Um, have you thought of trying to date the structural fabrics at all? I mean, there's sort of, sort of micaceous um, extensional fabrics, I think, in some of those outcrops on the um, you know, the Lyle Highway there. Yeah, no, I haven't thought about that specifically, no. Um, yeah, but that, that, that could be an interesting thing, thing to do. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's obviously um, 
the, the exhumation part, side of things is very interesting um, and complex as well, as is the older stuff. So um, maybe rubidium, strontium, perhaps. Um, the Zircon stuff looks great. I mean, the data look, look beautiful. Um, I would just make a comment based on, I think it might've been, is it Mark's comment earlier? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Mark earlier, that, that, that those, um, those monazite data wrong, wrongs um, were great, but they're, they're um, elemental data, so they're sort of, they're not actually, you know, they're not isotopic data, so that there's, there's quite a lot of issues with that. We, we don't tend to do that very much now. Um, but, you know, they were, good for, they were good for what they were. They should, they should be minimum ages, though, so that's, that is a bit of a problem. All right, any final comment to Dylan? Before we wrap it up? No? All right, well, honestly, I'd like to thank both Dylan and Tegan um, for doing our first Zoom GSA session. I think it worked really nicely and it's um, been really great to have Tazzy joining us. Um, I think it's something we should definitely look at doing cross division talks a bit more often, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it was really good. So thank you everyone for joining and um, we'll uh, keep you updated with with the uh, next meeting and uh, yeah all right see everyone thank you Dylan thank you, thank you again cheers